okay this video is uh, to help you revise for your uh, term test uh, which is going to be on light uh, that includes lenses uh, wave in general and your EM spectrum um, so uh, so this worksheet doesn't cover every content but uh, maybe the more tricky ones that uh, required uh, a bit more revision so first of all i have listed some of the definitions that uh, uh, that that test usually uh, would ask you for so this list right is not complete i'm just highlighting those that are more common when uh, they are asking uh, for definitions so for example if you look at uh, the list right here you will see that uh, uh, I, I have actually missed out the definition of a uh, transverse wave and your longitudinal wave so um, like I said uh, this is not a complete list that's why I put down uh, in the bracket it is not limited to just this few definition there could be more so uh, always look through your textbook uh, and then make your own notes okay so first of all um, uh, what I will do is that uh, uh, the reason why I posted this video is so that uh, you could uh, watch the revision uh, at your own time and uh, you are supposed to finish uh, the worksheet before watching this video so if you have not done so uh, please um, finish it and then you can continue watching this video so for those who have finished uh, this video will go through all the questions uh, you are supposed to uh, make corrections take down notes uh, just use another pen of different color to, to do your marking so I will ask for um, these worksheets to be submitted so that I can check that every one of you have tried the worksheet that you have watched the video and uh, have done your correction so when I collect your worksheet I'm expecting it to be complete marked with a different color pen and uh, jot down some notes uh, uh, if you find anything that is new to you so first of all uh, this is uh, question one so question one I actually adopted it from uh, uh, one of the TYS question I believe it is 2015 one of the long question so uh, what what does this uh, why, why is this question special is that uh, it involves one of the key concepts about image formation. So uh, let, let us go through some of the content first before we talk about this question. So uh, in terms of um, image formation, the first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, if you have an illuminated object uh, and then you put a converging lens uh, in front, what the converging lens does is that due to the shape of the converging lens, it will actually ban uh, all the lights emitted from the object so for example this is usually uh, the symbol for our object so all the light from the object will get banned to a certain point due to the curvature of this uh, lens so for example most of the time we will just pick one point of the object and we will look at all the light that is being emitted out in all directions okay so uh, in this case um, we can draw as many rays as we can but uh, if you still can recall the rules of drawing ray diagram there are two rays that will follow a certain rule uh, and that's why most of the ray diagram we are interested in uh, in looking into that in, into those two rays so one of it will be a ray from the object and uh, going through the optical center so if you have forgotten optical center refer to the cross section uh, between the principal axis which is this this line the horizontal line and the lens so what happened is that uh, any light ray that cuts through the uh, optical center will not get bent okay that is one of the characteristics of your converging lens and if you have a light ray that is parallel to the principal axis like i say this is the principal axis okay if you have a light ray that is parallel to it then the converging lens will bend bend it 
towards its focal point so for example if i know this is the focal point then the converging lens will actually bend this parallel ray down towards the focal point and if i use these two ray i can see that these two ray will converge at this point over here the red dot and then i can establish that all the light ray that is emitted from the tip of this uh, object will definitely converge towards this red dot okay so that's why we are using these two ray uh, whenever we are doing ray diagram okay so this is just a simple revision but uh, that is not my, my, my main point that I want to bring across so what happened is that um, you have done your lab and if you move your uh, screen on the other side of the lens if you put your if you put your screen uh for example if you put it like anywhere like uh wait let me redraw this uh how do i do that okay so if let's say i i i just anyhow position my screen for example if i do it here then what happened is that you would see a image that's not sharp and then if you move back and forth there will be a point whereby you will get a sharp image and usually that uh, and, and by theory that position is actually where the uh, rays are converging what i want to uh, highlight is uh, why is this sharp and why is this blur uh, the reason is because if you put your screen uh, over here you can actually see that uh, the light from the object we actually hit for example in this instance we actually hit the screen at multiple instances and of course i'm just showing you the two key ray in fact if i draw out all the rays from this object you can see that it is not just two instances, but actually multiple instances you can see that it hits them everywhere so what happened is that this particular tip of the object will appear multiple times on the screen if I put it over here. And as a result, these images will overlap each other to produce a very blur image. But if I have shifted my screen uh, to the point whereby the light ray converge like here, what happened is that all the lights from the object will actually hit this particular screen, the blue one, at only one spot and because of that there will only be one image and that's why you will see it as sharp now understanding this then we can move on to your question one so what is your question one about is that uh, we are trying to reflect light and normally when we reflect light uh, we would actually use a mirror a normal glass mirror uh, so this question will show you why in a very sensitive light equipment like periscope or camera we don't really rely on mirrors to redirect light okay so let's uh, go through this question so in part one it is a standard thing i have a glass pre prism uh, i shoot a beam of light in and uh, uh, because it satisfied the two conditions for total internal reflex reflection uh, the beam is actually being uh, bent over here and then it exits. So the first question down, the first thing that I want to uh, question you is that about this phenomenon. Why is it that when light crosses from air into your glass prism, the light ray didn't bend? Okay, so there are two possibilities. One is that the glass prism actually has the same reflect refractive index as the air but it is very unlikely right because glass is so much uh, denser than air so it is very unlikely that uh, the glass prism has the same refractive index as air and in fact uh, in the question i have also highlighted that it is a mid it is between medium of different refractive index so definitely they are uh, this this explanation cannot be valid so uh, what is the other possibility that will uh, actually causes your light to to continue its direction without refraction when crossing uh, between boundary so the other only explanation is that if you have incident the ray at zero degree so uh, most of the common mistake is that students tend to use the boundary which is this red line 
and then they compare it with the light ray which is this green line and tell me that oh the angle of incidence is 90. Now this is completely wrong okay the angle of incidence is actually measured from the normal which is this red dotted line. As you can see actually the light ray is falling on the normal so when your light ray and the normal is parallel we say that your angle of incidence is zero so how do we explain that well simply say that it is just one line so you can just give a one-liner answer the angle of incidence is equals to zero degree well uh, and if it is a, 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 answer, a, a question that requires you uh, to write down more detail then code the laws that will enable you to determine the angle of refraction which is your Snell's law so by Snell's law okay you don't even need to write down the formula okay you just need to write down the conclusion by Snell's law therefore your angle of refraction will also be zero degree so therefore your ray will appears okay to to have no bending of course uh, i am writing the most complete answer for you so for example if this is a two mark question or for example it is a one mark question but with two answer lines so what do i mean by answer line this one okay so the number of answer line will actually tell you how detailed uh, the examiner is expecting of your answer so uh, what are the two things so this is what we call a description or uh, the identification of the key uh, condition okay so as you can see in this entire diagram the diagram didn't show you that the angle of incident is zero so if you write down this statement angle of incident is zero it shows that it shows to the examiner that you understand that this is the key criteria for this thing to happen and if more details are required then you quote the law so you meaning that you need to know the name of the law you quote the law that will actually relate the angle of incident with the angle of refraction and finally uh, just for completeness you can include a concluding statement to your answer for this structure kind of uh, structure question that you are seeing here can so this is the uh, answer for part a so let's look at uh, your your part two okay uh, part two basically uh, I gave you the refractive index of uh, both uh, the glass prism and the air I purposely changed the uh, refractive index of air so that you get to practice the full formula for the snail's law rather than following uh, this equation so in your textbook they have actually this equation to enable you to find your critical angle so uh, the critical angle is given by this alphabet and as long as you know um, the refractive index of the glass prism you can actually uh, find the critical angle but this is what we call a simplified solution so this 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 particular uh, formula only works if the other medium has a refractive index of one so for example in exam whereby uh, they didn't actually specify the specific they didn't specify the uh, refractive index of air is one uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is other value like 1.02 you can uh, you can by default assume that the refractive index of air is one okay so anyway uh, like I said this is a uh, this is a uh, what you call that a revision worksheet so because of that I, I am uh, I am designing the question to force you to actually derive the critical angle from the Snell's law so uh, let me show you how so the Snell's law says that uh, n1 sine theta 1 equals to n2 sine theta 2 uh, how you use this formula is that you can imagine that uh, on this side is one medium on the other side is the other medium so whatever angles that is in the uh, medium you put it in that, that particular side so in this case I am trying to search for critical angle and I know that for uh, something to reach critical angle let's say i hit the class prism here and uh, if i am hitting it 
at critical angle so let's say if i'm hitting it at critical angle then the resulting refracted ray will actually take the path this way and if that is so then uh, the angle in the air side would be your 90 degree so understanding the uh, meaning of critical angle then we can substitute so what is the refractive index of air it comes from this 1.02 so i will write down here 1.02 sine theta so what is the angle in the air side the angle in the air side is this right right this side is air and inside here is actually your prism correct so here i will write 90 yeah uh n of the prism is actually 2.40 okay and then i need to know the angle in the prism which is the unknown that we are trying to find c the critical angle so by solving this okay you can actually find out what is your c and it should be 25.2 uh, I am writing 3SF for you so that you can check the accuracy. In exam, always give to 2SF. Okay, so that is your part 2. Now, let's compare it with a glass mirror. So, uh, in your lab, I have been emphasizing that uh, your mirror actually makes up of two surfaces. The glass and then the back green color surfaces, which is this silver reflecting surface. So what happens is that when you have a beam of light from the object incident on this glass mirror, part of the ray will actually undergo reflection and it gets bounced off because the glass is very smooth. Some of the light will actually go through into the glass and then a point reaching the other side, which is a silver coating, it will get bounced back and then it will exit the glass parallel to it and it will form. Now what you notice is that now instead of one is to one like in this case you have one incident ray one imaging emerging ray so it is like one one light from the object resulted in here so you get one image okay so remember like like this you will only get a sharp image when your emerging ray does not overlap and if you create multiple image for example in the case whereby you put the screen at the very blur distance you will end up with multiple images overlapping and if you see this diagram this is exactly what has happened right one incident ray resulted in two emerging ray that is responsible for creating images so now as you can see this image is overlapping so because of that you will not actually get a very sharp image yeah so that is the underlying principle about this so let's look at this uh, same thing apply your Schnell's law so I'm just giving you more opportunity to practice so if this is the air side then this is the glass side air side uh, I'm asking you to take 1.02 uh, and then the angle uh, in the air side would be here because you are incident from the uh, the, 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 the air side so this angle here is your 45 and then you will have a 1.45 which is your refractive index of glass sine theta this theta refers to the angle that is inside here this one so the angle inside here is also known as the angle of refraction okay so you need to know the name if not you won't be able to uh, solve it okay so uh, once you do that, you can solve this algebra and you will be able to get this value and uh, remember 2SF. So that's how you solve it. Okay, so uh, comparing this, why the image formed by the mirror is not clear. So uh, in the, at the beginning of the, I mean, uh, I think a few minutes ago, I have already explained that to you. Uh, that is because uh, you can say that from your figure 1.2, uh, the mirror right will form two keyword number one multiple and overlapping images and because they form uh, multiple and overlapping images therefore the image form is not clear 
So we explain why 1.2 is not clear. We also need to explain why 1.1 is clear. And as you can see, uh, three lines are given to us to answer this question. So the examiner is expecting a certain level of detail. So from 1.1, uh, only one image is produced. Therefore, it is sharp. Okay, so that's your question one. Okay, question two, I strongly, strongly advise you to try. Uh, I'll give you some hint. Okay, before I go through the, uh, the question, I'll give you some hint. So the hint here is that uh, uh, you can treat it like two points. So you can treat A as a point and then B as a point and then you do it uh, separately. And when you are doing this, it's always the same two rays that you will be interested in. Okay, that means the ray that uh, that goes cuts through the optical center and then one ray that is parallel to the principal axis. Okay, so that is the hint for you for part A. Okay, for your part B, for your part B, you can treat it as this is one object and uh, they already tell you that uh, this is how one ray from the object, the base object will look like. So um, you can also shoot one ray here, right? So where will the object form of the base? Where will the image of the uh, object form? Well, that's, that's one hint. Okay. So anyway, I will uh, go through the thing now. Uh, like I said, uh, try first. If really, really, really cannot, then uh, you can watch this video. Um, I will try to use the... Uh, okay, I will just use a ruler. A good old ruler. So let's do uh, A first. Okay. So A is uh, quite straightforward. So like I said, uh, do one by one. So I will do the first one first. I mean, I will do A first. Uh, so the same two ray, always these two ray you try to establish one that cuts through the optical center. Then uh, the other ray, you will be uh, parallel to the principal axis. And uh, if it is parallel to the principal axis, then the uh, after going through the lens, it will definitely bend towards the uh, focal point. So I have this. So it means that uh, the light from my object at A will reappear here. So this is my A, okay, my image of A. So this apostrophe down here is a physics short form to denote image of. So now I have done with uh, object A, I will do object B. So same thing, I will have a ray parallel to the principal axis. I will also have a ray that is cutting through the uh, optical center. Okay. Then, uh, like I said, the ray that is parallel to the principal axis will, oops, will actually uh, bend towards the focal point. So I will do that. And uh, add in the arrows, which are important one mark. Okay. Then uh, you will see that uh, I think I didn't draw it that well, but uh, if you do it on uh, full scan, you should be, oh, I know why. You should be able to uh, form a proper one. Let me try again. Huh? I must cut correctly though, you see? I can cut it correctly, like uh, here. Yeah, I didn't really cut the center here just now. So once I do that, I know that this is actually my B prime. Yeah, and uh, my image will actually appear like this. And uh, I use solid line to draw my image because it is real. What is real? Real means you can uh, form on a screen. Okay, so that's your part A. Part B is more tricky. So uh, you, you, you can treat the base as an object on its own. So there will be a ray like that. Uh, but I don't know where we converge. We converge here, 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 or here. I do not know. So I have to draw another ray. So I I can like I said uh, over here. I will always draw the ray that cuts through the optical center, right? So this is I treat this as my object. 
I draw a ray that cuts through my optical center. Where will it be? Well, here lah. Right? So once I go through, I realize that, hey, I have two rays now. And uh, the intersection will, will be the point of convergence. And I can see that, oh, here. This is my point of convergence. This is the image of the base. Right? Which is denoted by B. Yeah? Then, after that, what should I do? I know that my image the image of my base is here that means i know the rest of the image must be along this dotted line it, it is somewhere but i do not know where exactly so how do i do that i need to determine where is the top of my image right top of my image comes from top of my object so like i said always draw the same two line from object cuts the optical center i can do one line h i know now where it is right if this is uh one ray and i know that my my image of my entire object has to be along this red dotted line this red dotted line then i would say that oh my tip must be appearing here so this is actually how my image will look like and if i know that then i can see that this is here oh shy sir okay this f uh, shouldn't be given Okay, I will delete it from your, from your, from your worksheet. So, uh, sorry about this. I will, uh, I will edit the worksheet. So, the, the whole idea is that you need to determine the uh, focal length, right? So, uh, you need to draw this horizontal beam. Why? Because I know that all the light will be converging over here. Right? So, if I draw this parallel, uh, this, this beam of light that is parallel to your principal axis, then what will it do? It will definitely, after cutting through this point, will bend towards my converging point, right? Correct? And by our rule, right? What is our rule? For example, here we have our rule, right? When you have a parallel beam, it will then bend towards the focal point. So what is this point? This point is actually our focal point F. Okay? On your worksheet, I would have deleted that F okay so sorry about that okay finally question three okay okay your question three uh is about a uh, wave your law is, is about uh asking you about your knowledge about wave so first thing uh you are given this circular wave front uh then they will ask you what is the wavelength so just remember every uh, wavefront you can imagine it as crest so uh, what is the wavelength crest to crest law so this is one wave two wave three complete wave so now you know that three complete wave is 12 cm one complete wave will be 4 cm and so 2 sf that's it right next thing you are given a displacement time graph yes the amplitude is dropping because uh energy is lost uh, you are asked to find the speed so there are two ways you can either find the speed by distance over time so uh, distance well i know uh, if the wave run travel from this circle to the outer circle it will have traveled 12 cm but i do not know how much time has passed so i cannot use this formula the other formula that i know will be your v equals to f lambda v is speed f is frequency lambda is your wavelength so do i know f well if i am given the displacement time graph i can actually find the period from it and with the period i can actually find the frequency because frequency equals to one over period so how to find how to find period period means the time taken for one complete wave to be generated right what is one complete wave no this is one complete wave right so the time taken for one complete wave generated is one minute so now i know from here that your period is one minute so your frequency will be one over t remember to convert this into seconds so i already know that uh, this equation will become one over 60 multiplied by lambda which i know is 4 cm so 4 cm is actually how many meter okay so be very uh, mindful this is in meter this is in one over seconds or in hertz 
So once you multiply these uh, numbers together, you will get this value. Yeah. Of course, you can leave your answer in standard form as well if your math is good. Can. Okay, for your part B is a structure question. So same thing. Uh, you will notice that uh, you will need to describe what you notice. What is the key char key uh key key? What do you call that? Uh, the key things that you notice. The key difference. Okay. So if you compare this diagram with the first diagram, which is uh, right on top here, so I call it the green, and if you compare the yellow, you can see that the gap between the wave front is different, right? The gap here is actually dropping. Yeah, so first thing you can uh, highlight that. Well, I, I will write my answer on top. Uh, it's easier in point form. You can write it uh, in sentences. So first thing you will notice that actually the gap between your wave front decreases right from a to b so the first thing you notice is that the gap becomes smaller so this shows that you can interpret the diagram yeah then the next thing is you notice this uh, characteristic about your diagram what does it mean well it means that your wavelength decreases decrease eh, wrong spelling decreases from a to b why is it decreases because earlier on we say that your wavelength is actually given by the gap between the wave front so like here it sees one complete wavelength two complete three complete so down here you can see that your wave front is becoming smaller and smaller okay oh i am so sorry on your worksheet i think i have already updated the a is over here so it's different so it's easier for you to interpret so you can see that the number is becoming smaller and smaller so then what does it mean with the number getting smaller and sl smaller now what what you need to know is that by your formula v equals to f lambda now your frequency is always constant okay because the frequency of the disturbance come from the dipper so if you are using the same dipper the dipper will vibrate at the same frequency so your wave generated will be of the same frequency as well so if now you look at what you have uh, on hand you know that your wavelength is dropping right you also know that your frequency is constant so frequency is constant but your wavelength is dropping what can you conclude you can conclude that actually your v will also be decrease decreasing uh from your a to your b right so when your v drops from a to b what does it mean then you need to activate one of the other content knowledge so you know that if you have deeper water your water wave will actually go faster right your water wave will actually go faster so it means that if you have shallow water your wave will actually go slower so how do i remember this is that shallow slow okay so if now your v is dropping from a to b and you know that the speed of the wave has something to do with the depth what can you conclude a deeper or b deeper so obviously then you can conclude that therefore your a is deeper than your b right so with that you can answer well describe the depth well the depth is that a is deeper than b and then i have to explain right how do i explain i just need to go reverse right how do i explain i need to say that oh uh because i noticed that uh the gap is becoming smaller so the wavelength becoming smaller by you need to code code the formula by v equals to f lambda when your lambda becomes smaller it means that your speed becomes smaller so that that is how i make my deduction okay so this part i want to see your correction and i will read it okay down here you this is the final question about em spectrum so you have this uh, uh this graph 
and uh, in O-level they will give you all sorts of graph and you need to try your best to interpret. So I have given you a context, you need to read it. So as you can see down here, uh, they gave you um, the wavelength of the uh, waves that is being emitted by this filament wire. So because they gave you a range of wave, you can see that they even give it to you how it is separated. So this spectrum is called is uh, falling under the UV, UV uh, part and then down here visible light and then finally the remainder will be your infrared okay so down here it actually shows you 3 EM spectrum your ultraviolet you have to you have to write down the full name uh, in your in your exam visible light and then your infrared yeah down here how to convert please read your textbook I think it is 6000 minus 273 and it will give you the answer now down here, uh, part two, they are asking you about efficiency. So what is efficiency? Efficiency is basically your useful output, whatever, over your total input. So if you have a high efficiency, that means, let's say you put in 100 joules of energy, and you put in 100 joules of energy, if you have an efficiency of 80%, it means that uh, out of the 100 joules, 80 joules will be converted into something that is useful to you. The other 20 joules will be lost. Okay? Now, um, so how do I do this? So it is very low at uh, 3000K. Uh, I also, because I need to know what is the meaning of useful, uh, so I need to know what is the use of this filament wire. So I need to read the context. So by reading the context, I actually learned that the filament wire is actually used to give out light it is used to light up our surrounding so unless it give out light that we can see it is useful other than that all the rest are useless so let's look at this question i'm looking at 3000 kelvin uh, why the efficiency is so low so i look at the diagram i look for 3000 kelvin let me clean it up first so i look for 3000 3000 kelvin is this line as you can see this line they have this uh, symbol here what does it mean it means lambda is wavelength maximum that means that is the maximum uh, intensity given so at 3000 Kelvin what are the EM wave that is being emitted over here well I have some sort of visible light that is useful to me but then after that all the rest from here onwards are actually infrared that we cannot see once it is in the infrared spectrum we can't see we are not snakes so because of that most of the uh, emission is actually infrared which we can't see and that is not our purpose right so that's why the efficiency is so low okay now i want to see how you articulate yourself over here how do you explain so like i said the steps is you need to show me that you can identify the data from the materials given from the data that you identified you need to relate to the context and show your understanding of physics uh, knowledge so what is the physics knowledge involved here number one you can't see infrared so it cannot light up your surrounding by infrared right and you also need to uh, break it open uh, or, or in your in your in your answer you also need to show me that you understand what is the meaning of efficiency that it has to do with useful output versus total input okay so i look forward to uh, reading your your articulation over here okay then after that i have this uh part three uh what is the temperature at which the efficiency is the highest so I, uh, efficiency is highest, meaning that I have the most useful outcome. You, most useful outcome is what? what? What is useful outcome to us in this context? Useful outcome in this context to us must be visible light. So wow, you see, there's a peak that's so high. What is the corresponding temperature? 6000 K. Okay. So articulate over here. Why is it that at 6000 K is the most efficient? Now the last question is what we call a high degree of difficulty because okay sometimes it's easy sometimes it's hard depending on how creative you are so suggest means that it is not really in your 
uh, in your textbook, you need to think on the spot. So when operating at the highest efficiency, what is the disadvantage? So I need to look into this graph. Number one is that there's a hint over here. At 6,000 Kelvin, how hot is your filament wire? It's very, very hot. What is the temperature that oxygen will combust? That's why. Okay. So it is risky because it is very, very hot. That's why in your light bulb, actually it use nitrogen uh, so that it doesn't burn, so that your, your, your filament wire will not uh, combust with your ox oxygen. Yeah, so they actually use a lot of nitrogen trapped inside your uh, light bulb. What is the second disadvantage? Second disadvantage is that although down here you have this peak of visible light, actually most of your energy is still is still wasted as for example down here you can see a lot of energy is used over here as ultraviolet and then you have another big chunk of energy over here yeah that is being used as infrared so even though you get a you get some visible light that is uh, coming out from your filament wire most of the energy is actually being emitted or radiated out as Way, uh, in wavelength that your eyes cannot see. So the other disadvantage is that it really wastes energy. Okay, so the homework here is that uh, you need to uh, articulate this yourself. I will mark here and then I want to see all your correction, your markings and all that uh, on, this work uh, on this worksheet. Okay, okay. so uh, Please revise this revision worksheet, right? It's just a bit of help that the teachers is giving you. It does not mean that after doing this worksheet, your revision is complete. You still need to make your own notes, read through all your worksheet, cover up the question, redo it at least one time, you know, read the textbook, check that all the examples in your textbook, you know how to solve. Can? So all the best and uh, sleep early. Okay, goodbye.